Hey everyone, Nigel and Luke here, and welcome to part two of our series of videos focusing on mysterious cases involving missing campers. If you haven't seen part one, be sure to check that out first. We'll leave a link in the description below. As always, don't forget to like and subscribe to Crime Zone for more true crime content like this. It really helps us to continue building the channel. With that out of the way, here is part two of three mysterious cases of missing campers. On the night of Friday, May 28, 2011, 21-year-old Madison Scott left her home in Vanderhoof, British Columbia with her friend Jordi Bolduc. The two women were headed to Hogsback Lake to attend an annual birthday party held by one of their friends and planned to camp out overnight. The pair drove to the lake with all of the supplies they thought they would need for an evening in Madison's white 1990 Ford F-50 pickup. However, shortly after they arrived, sometime after 8 p.m., and began to set up their tent, they realized that they'd forgotten their tent poles and decided to return to Vanderhoof to pick them up along with a larger tent. Though Hogsback Lake is located in a remote area, it's only about a 20-minute drive from Vanderhoof, roughly 20 kilometers off of BC's Highway 16. After briefly talking with Madison's mother, Dawn, Madison and Jordy returned to the campsite, set up, and began to collect some firewood with the small group of people that had already arrived. As they did so, others soon began to show up, many of whom Madison and Jordy did not know. Several of Madison's friends would later remark that as the party began to reach full swing, a large number of those in attendance were not well known to them and were not necessarily friends with the person throwing the party either. It is believed that they found out about the event because Garrett, the friend throwing the party, had advertised the gathering on Facebook. At approximately 12.30 a.m., Jordy told Madison that she had changed her mind about staying the night and was going to return home with her new boyfriend, Tyler. Madison supposedly pleaded with her to stay, but Jordy said she was done with the evening. Not only was she way too drunk, but a fight had recently broke out at the party and Jordy had been knocked into the campfire. Jordy offered Madison a ride home with her and Tyler, but Madison supposedly refused. She was already settled into the sleeping bag in her tent and was preparing to go to bed. Jordy and Tyler left shortly after. Over the next few hours, everyone else at the party also began to leave. It is unclear at what point Madison realized she would be the only person camping out that night, but around 3 a.m. on Saturday morning, the last of the partygoers left Hogsback Lake. At least one of those groups of people again asked Madison if she wanted to leave with them, and she apparently said no. At approximately 8.30 a.m. that morning, Jordy returned to the Hogsback Lake campsite to pick up the belongings that she had left behind the night before. She discovered Madison's tent unzipped with her sleeping bag pushed to the side and her truck locked and still parked where it had been the previous night. However, there was no sign of Madison anywhere. It is unclear what Jordy made of the situation at the time, but what we do know is that she was not alarmed enough to contact Madison's family. She needed to get to work that morning, so she simply grabbed her belongings and left the lake once again. Approximately two hours later, Garrett arrived to clean up the campsite from the previous evening. He also noticed that Madison's truck and tent were still at the site, but would later claim that the tent was zipped up so he assumed Madison was sleeping and left after he finished cleaning. This means that there would appear to be a discrepancy between Garrett and Jordy's account of Madison's tent, as Jordy said the tent was unzipped and Garrett said it was zipped up. However, we could not find any more information about the apparent discrepancy. Perhaps one of them was simply wrong. Throughout Saturday, there was no sign of Madison anywhere and neither her friends nor her family were able to get in contact with her. However, from the perspective of her family, this was not considered to be overly alarming. When Madison left the house the day before, she didn't really have any concrete plans. Her mother Dawn thought that she might be spending an extra night out on the lake or else had made different arrangements with some friends. Because cell reception was not the greatest out at the lake, it was not always possible to stay in contact. On Saturday night, there was another party held at the exact same spot as the night before. It is not clear whether this was organized by the same people, but what is known is that some people that knew Madison were in attendance, including her younger sister, Georgia. However, Georgia would not say anything about attending the party until a little later, since she was underage and was not supposed to be there. Madison's truck, tent, and belongings were still at the same site Saturday night, and at some point during the party, her tent was flattened by a young man in attendance. It remains unclear why he did this, but given the amount of alcohol present, we can likely assume that he was screwing around. While it seems strange that Madison's truck and belongings didn't draw more attention the second night, 
What's important to know is that the second party was much larger than the first. With more people in attendance, and not necessarily the same people, it might not have been obvious that the belongings were unattended. Madison also had yet to officially be reported missing, so no one would have had any reason to be suspicious. That would happen the next morning, when Madison's parents, Don and Eldon, began to grow concerned. It was one thing for their daughter to stay out for an extra night, but the lack of contact was becoming more and more worrying. Eldon and Don drove to Hogsback Lake that morning, and like several other witnesses from the day before, found their daughter's tent, truck, and belongings at the campsite. Unlike the others, however, Don and Eldon investigated closer. They discovered that with the exception of her iPhone 4, her ring of keys, and the clothes that she was wearing on the night she went to Hogsback Lake, none of Madison's possessions were missing. This included her purse, expensive motorbike equipment, alcohol, and other things that would have been the target for any likely thief. Dawn managed to find some other people camping nearby who knew her daughter and said they had not seen her, but confirmed that her truck and tent had not moved in the time that they had been there. Eldon did some larger circles of the area in an effort to track down Madison, but this search came up empty. At about 12.30 p.m., Don and Eldon contacted the RCMP to report their daughter missing. Police arrived in the area a short time later, and an official search began. This effort was expanded substantially on Monday. On the ground, volunteers and investigators searched on foot, horseback, and with all-terrain vehicles. Aerial searches were conducted, including some using infrared to spot residual body heat that might be on the ground. Police divers and boat searchers also spent substantial time looking in Hogsback Lake. Though water searches are notoriously difficult, Hogsback Lake is only 22 feet at its deepest and the water is clear with excellent visibility. Cadaver dogs were also brought in to search the edges of the lake to pick up any potential scent. Unfortunately, none of these efforts managed to turn up any sign of Madison Scott. When police called off the official search a few days later, Madison's family and friends continued looking and also started an awareness campaign about her disappearance. At least 150 volunteers distributed flyers, bumper stickers, posters, and other items designed to aid in the police investigation. An initial reward of $15,000 offered for information in the case quickly increased to $100,000. The disappearance rocked the small and tight-knit community of Vanderhoof, which only has a population of 4,500. Madison's heartbroken family made numerous public appeals, hoping for her safe return. However, years passed and the case remained a mystery. While theories in the case ranged from Madison running away to suffering some sort of accident, most involved some sort of foul play. In terms of the runaway theory, it really seems like there's no evidence to suggest this is what happened, nor does it seem like there was any reason for Madison to run away. Her home life was happy, and she was described as an outgoing and social person with a large friend group. Also, if she was planning to run away, why leave her vehicle and possessions behind? The accident theory is slightly easier to believe, though again, there is little evidence indicating what could have happened. Family and friends say that it is hard to believe that Madison could have simply walked away from her campsite, nor would it have made sense to do so. One semi-plausible theory is that Madison was the victim of an animal attack. There are some reports that a cougar had recently been spotted in the area, and these attacks do happen. But again, if this were the case, some remains likely would have been discovered during that initial search, or there would have at least been some evidence of a struggle at the campsite. Neither of these things were found. That leaves the numerous foul play theories that have emerged over the years. At the time of the disappearance, Madison's mother said that there was a man she was interested in romantically who wasn't interested in her. Friends said that there was another man who was interested in Madison, but whose feelings she did not return. He was considered suspicious by the friends because they knew that privately he had been upset and angry that Madison didn't feel the same way. Both men were apparently interviewed by police, but there was no evidence actually linking them to the disappearance. In several of the sources we came across during our research, Don Scott mentioned that there was a record of a call made to Madison's phone at around 12.30 a.m. on the morning of her disappearance. She said that the call was from, quote, a young guy who knew her, but did not elaborate further. It is unclear whether this person is either of the two men previously mentioned, or is someone else entirely. A number of other foul play theories involve Madison's friend Jordy. Many found it suspicious that Jordy would leave her friend behind, or that she would agree to camp out with Madison that night in the first place if she knew she was going to be hanging out with her new boyfriend. However, it appears that Jordy's relationship with her boyfriend had only really begun that evening, meaning that her plans simply may have changed. 
As to why she didn't contact Madison's family after finding her empty tent on Saturday morning, it's bizarre, but perhaps she was simply hungover and in a rush. There are numerous sources that say Jordy agreed to take several polygraph tests, and she claims that on at least one of those occasions, police told her that, quote, she aced it. The rest of the most notable theories in the case revolve around either a serial killer or some sort of stranger being involved in Madison's disappearance. The American serial killer Israel Keyes has been suggested many times, but as he is from Alaska, this would have been a substantial distance to travel for a kidnapping or murder. Though it is technically possible, as Keyes did travel long distances to commit some of his crimes, his MO was also usually to steal things from his victims. Given that almost all of Madison's belongings were found at her campsite, many view it as unlikely that Keyes was involved. Given the case's proximity to Highway 16, there have also been numerous suggestions that Madison's disappearance could be related to some of the notorious Highway of Tears cases. At least two disappearances in the area, those of Bonnie Marie Joseph and Anita Florence, are somewhat similar to Madison's, in that the women vanished, but their vehicles and some of their valuables were left behind. However, Madison's family has fought particularly hard not to have her disappearance associated with those cases. It is not exactly clear why this is, but based on interviews we saw with Don Scott, it appears she does not believe her daughter's disappearance is connected. While all of these theories are technically possible, no evidence has been found to prove the involvement of a serial killer or some other random stranger. It should also be noted that due to the lack of a struggle found at Madison's campsite, many believe that if foul play was involved, she likely left with the perpetrator willingly. This would seem to suggest that the culprit was someone she knew, rather than a stranger. As we near the 10-year anniversary of Madison's disappearance at the end of this month, there are sadly few answers to be had in the case. She is remembered by her friends and family as an independent, outgoing, and vibrant person who would have given the shirt off her back for a friend in need. Hopefully, new evidence will emerge in the case, and this tragic and mysterious story can finally be brought to a close. Do you know of any other cases like this that you think we should check out? Tell us about them in the comments section below. As always, if you enjoyed our video, don't forget to like and subscribe to Crime Zone for more true crime content like this, making sure to hit the notification bell to stay up to date with our latest releases. Thank you for watching.